Hey yo, what is up you guys and welcome back into One Piece chapter 1102. My name is Sai and as per usual, we're going to be breaking down the latest chapter of One Piece and just talking a little bit about it. So with that being said, let's get to it. So normally I love to dissect the cover pages and try to extract some hidden meaning behind even the reader requested ones. But this time around, I have no clue. So what's featured this week is a little bit hard to explain. So there's a hot dog assembly line. You got four wolves working on the hot dogs. And at the very end of the line is Bonnie. And instead of assembling the hot dogs, she's eating them. And that's not even the most blasphemous part, right? Not only is Bonnie ruining the hot dog assembly line, but she's also eating hot dogs with a side of milk. An idea I saw someone say is that maybe these five wolves represent the five Gorosei members, and honestly, I don't think that's such a bad idea. Bonnie eating a hot dog is a little bit interesting, at least, because Saint Saturn is the only other character in One Piece that has sat down and had a glizzy. All right, so moving past the cover page, finally, we go on to the first page of the chapter where we can see the Bonnie Pirates going after Kuma. This is gonna sound a little bit silly, but because it was so recent, this panel of Bonnie and her crew jumping off of her ship kind of reminds me of Roger and the Rocks Pirates arriving at God's Valley and how we have a little spread of all of them just leading the charge. Bonnie kind of gives off that same energy here in this first page. And not to mention, Gyogyo looks like an absolute monster here. He really does look like the second in command of the Bonnie Pirates. So when the Bonnie Pirates arrive at this island, they end up scuffling with a couple of Marines. And it turns out that Bonnie actually has a really bad rep in the world because they believe that Bonnie and her pirates only attack young kids and the elderly. Little do they know though, that that is actually just Bonnie's devil fruit power. Bonnie doesn't actually attack kids and old people. Considering the fact that Bonnie's powers are only temporary and all these young kids and old people will eventually just turn back into their able-bodied selves, it's kind of crazy that this rumor has spread in such a manner. So after Bonnie deals with the Marines, she starts asking around to see if anybody has seen her father or as she describes him, a really big guy. Even though Kuma is within earshot of this conversation and he knows that his daughter is looking for him, he ends up poofing away nonetheless because he knows that the minute the government hears that Kuma and Bonnie have linked up, the world government will then be after Bonnie. Technically though, the world government and Marines are always after Bonnie because she is a pirate, but once they capture her, they more or less have to let her go because of their agreement with Kuma. And more or less, we've seen an instance of this happen already, where Kainu had Bonnie in custody, and then we fast forward a little bit, and Bonnie is surprisingly out of custody. Which now makes me wish we saw that interaction go all the way through, right? A Kainu finds Bonnie, he captures her, and then what happens after that? Does he just say, hey, have a great day? Or does he lock her in a cell and leave the door open? I'm not too sure. But yeah, for Bonnie's safety and his deal with the world government, he just simply cannot meet up with his daughter right now. We cut back over to Bonnie's perspective and she's pretty upset that she hasn't found her dad yet, but she says, hey, we're still looking. And while we're looking, we should also look for Sun God Nika. Little does she know though, that in the near future, she'll be in the same room as the Sun God Nika Luffy. I wonder what reaction Bonnie will have to Luffy after she finds out that he is indeed Sun God Nika. Like, will she start worshiping him? Will she start asking him for favors and to save her father? And on top of it all, will she even believe that Luffy is Nika? And not to mention, but Luffy doesn't even know that he has a mythical Zoan yet. So this is gonna be a shocker for Luffy as well. Speaking of Luffy though, right after Bonnie mentions looking for Sun God Nika, we cut over to Luffy and we see that he just got his first bounty for defeating Arlong. Because of this, we get a myriad of reactions from different characters. We have Sabo, Dragon, Smoker, Jinbei, Ace, and even Kuma. Something funny that came out of this though is that someone over on Twitter has been keeping count of how many years it's been since we've last seen Smoker in the manga. And apparently, it's been about eight years since we've last seen Smokey. So the reason why Smoker was brought into this chapter in the first place is because Dragon wants to go to Logtown. You know, after he saw his son's first bounty poster, he must have been like, dang. So if he's in the East Blue still and he just beat Arlong, that means his next town is Logtown. So Dragon asks Sabo who's in charge over at Logtown, and that is when Sabo responds with Captain Smoker, which is why we see him in this chapter. And 
you know, obviously it's nice because we see Smoker again, but now I'm just kind of curious to see if Dragon and Smoker may have had some history in the past, since we do know that Dragon was once a part of the Navy. Never mind, scratch that thought, because I just remembered that during Roger's execution, Dragon was more or less a rogue from the looks of it, and Smoker was still a 12-year-old boy. So there's a good chance that they never met each other in the Navy, and instead Smoker must have just heard rumors about Dragon, and or he probably just knows that he's the world's most wanted criminal. So going on a little bit, we see that the pacifistas are being mass produced right now, right? They're still in their tubes, they're still cooking in the oven, and Kuma's like, yo, this is a little bit unsettling. And you know what? That's pretty fair. Even though Kuma knew that he was going to be cloned, there's just something about seeing, you know, 10 different identical versions of you in test tubes that just feels a little bit off. So Vegapunk and Kuma kick the can a little bit and they start talking about a boy who just attacked a world government office, Eni's lobby. And this boy just so happens to have rubber powers like Kuma's idol, Sun God Nika. I love that Kuma is slowly putting these pieces together. And now that we see Kuma doing it, I cannot wait to see the Gorsei and Emu's perspective on Luffy throughout the years, right? As Luffy is growing and getting crazier and crazier bounties, I want to see what the Gorosei and Emu have to say. Because in Kuma's case, all he has are rumors and stories about Nika. Whereas the Gorosei, and even if not them, Emu should have almost first-hand records about what Sun God Nika was like. And not to mention, they know that Luffy has the D in his name. He has the D initial. I want to see if the Gorosei can also put the pieces together and say, wow, this kid sounds like Nika. So we go on with the chapter and we see past events where Kuma is involved with the Straw Hats. And the first one we see is Thriller Bark. And Kuma doesn't add anything new here. There's no new dialogue except for what Kuma says about the pain bubble that he extracted out of Luffy. And he makes note of its size. He's like, yo, a pain bubble this big? Even I might pass out from this one. Which is pretty cool, of course, because that's pretty much saying that Zoro has adult buccaneer endurance. What I would have loved to have seen out of this thriller bark retelling, though, is what Kuma would have done if Zoro wasn't awake to take the pain bubble, or if all of the straw hats were incapacitated at the time. Because this might sound crazy, but based off of what we know about Kuma and his personality, I can't imagine that Kuma would actually take Luffy to the world government and or capture Luffy. Would he still have taken Luffy's pain out of his body? And maybe if Zoro wasn't awake, Kuma would have taken it onto himself? I really wish we could have seen his plan B or plan C coming off of Thriller Bark. So we skip over to the next island and Kuma gets summoned to go to the Summit War, or at least get ready for the Summit War. But instead, he makes a quick stop to Sabodi because his daughter's there. And we see that Kuma was actually outside of the restaurant Bonnie was first introduced in. As silly as it sounds, this right here is one of my favorite parts about the chapter because it's just so goofy, right? You got this behemoth of a man just crouching down in a cloak, staring at his daughter from the window. And here's the thing, his head takes up like the entire window, but nobody notices. Except for the couple, of course, right beside the window. It kind of reminds me of that meme where you see like this bigger dude hiding behind a really skinny tree. This is giving off that same vibe. What really hits about this scene though, is that this is probably the closest that Kuma has ever been to his daughter in the past two years. And this is the last time he even sees Bonnie in his life. So yeah, Kuma being a peeping Tom right here is hitting from all angles. The good times though, unfortunately do not last that long because he gets word that a pirate has just hit a celestial dragon. And we get to hear Kuma's inner monologue and what he has to say about it. He's like, yo, a pirate hit a celestial dragon? That's suicide. You know, like we're so close to Navy HQ. How could somebody actually do this? Kuma then peeps in from the rooftop and he notices that the people who hit the celestial dragon is in fact the straw hat pirates he just saved the other day. This moment right here probably solidified in Kuma's mind that Luffy and his crew are gonna be the pirates that change the world. Thinking of this from Kuma's point of view, he must have wished he could have hit a celestial dragon when Genie was captured, but he couldn't for one reason or another. Maybe he didn't want to go to Marie Joie, maybe he just knew that mission was suicide for him and the Revolutionary Army. He could not do it, but the Straw Hats did it. 
and they did it for a fishman. Kuma makes note that nobody has done this in hundreds and hundreds of years. This act of grace from Luffy was so impactful, so meaningful to him, that when he goes on and he saves the Straw Hats by paw-pawing them away, in his mind, he's like, yo, Luffy, one day you are going to be the man that saves the world. But of course, before Luffy can do that, he needs to train himself up because he's not ready for the new world. And Kuma sees that himself when he sees Luffy getting bodied by Sentomaru, Vegapunk, and the pacifistas. So yeah, he pawpaws everybody away. And what I really love about Kuma's character here is that Kuma doesn't once reassure Luffy that things will be okay. He doesn't ease up on Luffy or tries to take it easy on him. Kuma goes full in. He's frowning, he's looking like a menace. He is a monster in this scene, but that's all because he wants Luffy to grow. He doesn't want Luffy to just go back into his old ways and just meet up with his crew the next day. He wants Luffy to train. And I think Kuma played his part very well, and it's really wholesome seeing his inner monologue while Luffy is saying that he can't save his friends. So we end up fast forwarding a little bit, and it turns out that because of Kuma's insubordination, Saint Saturn wants to place a self-destruct system within Kuma. Vegapunk, of course, doesn't want to do it, but Saint Saturn says, yo, shut up, we hired you. You are doing this whether you like it or not, Vegapunk. And this system, or this self-destruction mechanism is something that we have not seen play out quite yet. So now, I'm kind of scared if Kuma shows up to Egghead Island, right? Because at first I was like, oh, Kuma's gonna come, he's gonna fight Saint Saturn, he's gonna save the day. But if Kuma really is programmed to self-destruct by Saturn's command, is there even gonna be a fight there? Would Saint Saturn just look at Kuma and say, hey, Kuma, blow yourself up and then it's game over? I have no clue. Or maybe this could be the perfect way Kuma goes out. Maybe Kuma can self-destruct with Saint Saturn. He could pull a straight up Android 16 against Cell. Oda really just opened up the door to more possibilities as to how Egghead Island and Kuma's end could play out. Oh yeah, speaking of new possibilities regarding Kuma, Vegapunk says, yo, I invented a switch that could instantly flip back Kuma's consciousness. It'll be like a split personality. We can bring him back whenever we want. But Saturn, of course, tells Vegapunk, hey, quit it. We want to erase his individuality, not preserve it. Saturn goes on and says, I too am a man of science. Any attempts to deceive me will fail. And this right here is why I'm split about the notion that we can flip back Kuma's consciousness. Because Saturn is the god warrior of scientific defense. He is one of the Gorose, one of the highest powers in the world. If Vegapunk manages to slip in this consciousness switch within Kuma, and Saint Saturn doesn't notice it, it just straight up would not look good for Saint Saturn's portrayal. But then again, Vegapunk is the world's smartest man, so him one-upping Saturn wouldn't necessarily be bad, but I don't know, I'm, I'm a little bit torn on this one. I feel like Vegapunk could easily just fly it under the radar, but I, in a weird way, just to hype up Saint Saturn a little bit more, I would like it if Saint Saturn is indeed smart enough to see through Vegapunk's deception. But yeah, with that being said, I would love to throw the question back to you guys. What do you think about Vegapunk's invention here? Do you think it will actually play a role in bringing back Kuma? Or no, do you think Saint Saturn is just that guy? And he'll stop Vegapunk before he cooks it up. Honestly though, the simplest solution would have been to just put this inside of Kuma and not tell Saint Saturn in the first place? Because let's be real, later in this chapter, Kuma's like, hey, Vegapunk, can you program me to protect the Thousand Sunny until the Straw Hats get back? And Vegapunk does it. Vegapunk didn't ask Saint Saturn if he could do it, Vegapunk just did it. Because in no world would Saint Saturn and the Gorosei agree to Kuma protecting the Thousand Sunny for Straw Hat Luffy. And going even beyond that, I doubt the world government would want Vegapunk to have Kuma's memories locked inside Egghead Island. That itself should be a crime, because the Gorosei wanted to erase Kuma's individuality and memories and consciousness and all that good stuff because of what he knows, because he's a buccaneer, because he knows about Nika. Just having Kuma's memories could be a crime, but Vegapunk went through with it anyways. And guess what? He didn't tell the world government then either. So now I'm just wondering, what else has Vegapunk done 
that he hasn't exactly told us yet. So Kuma and Vegapunk exchange a couple of last words, and I really love what Vegapunk says here. Kuma first says, So this is my life. I wonder how many people have been harmed or troubled by my actions. But Vegapunk responds, and he says, Troubled? Living is nothing without trouble, wouldn't you say? And I can't really put my finger on it, but I just really love those words because it rings true for just about anyone. And bouncing off of that, we get a beautiful montage of Kuma's life. We start from his infancy all the way up until the end. Uh, my favorite part about the running segment is you can actually see him trip and stumble when Ginny dies, but he manages to pick himself back up when Bonnie comes into the picture. This page right here is probably one of my favorite pages out of all of One Piece. It just perfectly encapsulates life and its struggles and how you fall down, you pick yourself back up, and you just keep on running at the end of the day. We cut over to the next page and we see Vegapunk pull the lever. The lever that will complete Kuma's transformation into a robot. And what are Kuma's final moments like? Well, he goes out with a smile. Just like all of the people out there in the world who have the D initial, Kuma goes out with a smile. This chapter is pretty straightforward. There's not too much to talk about. There's just a lot of emotions running high. And overall, it's a really good chapter. It's a perfect way to end this flashback. But with that being said, the one thing we can speculate on now, though, is what is Vegapunk's gift to Bonnie? I've been talking about this for a while now, but Vegapunk throughout Egghead has been wanting to give Bonnie some sort of gift. And even up to this point in Egghead Island, we still have no clue what that gift is yet. All we know for sure is that it doesn't involve Kuma's memories because Vegapunk didn't want Bonnie to go into the Kuma memory room. So if it's not related to that, what is it? If I had to take a shot in the dark, I would say that maybe Vegapunk is going to give Bonnie a command chip so that Bonnie has the authority above even the Gorosei to control the pacifista, because that right there would be a great gift. If there were anybody in the world of One Piece that should be able to control the pacifista army, it should be Bonnie, if not Vegapunk and Sentomaru. But then again, going against what I said earlier, there is a possibility that Vegapunk's gift does include Kuma's memories, but instead of giving her the memory bubble, maybe Vegapunk has Kuma's memories stored in a hard drive or USB chip. Because we do know that Vegapunk wanted to research Kuma's memories, so maybe Vegapunk was able to copy them to some extent. But I don't know how I feel about that one since Kuma didn't want Bonnie to go into the memories in the first place. Another thing I'm wondering about now is when will Vegapunk tell Bonnie happy 10th birthday? Because those right there, those are Kuma's dying words, his last request. And Vegapunk thus far, you know, from, from what we know, Vegapunk hasn't told her happy birthday yet. So I'm waiting for when Vegapunk will actually say this. Maybe Vegapunk's gonna stick up for Bonnie, fight St. Saturn, and he's like, Bonnie, happy 10th birthday. Maybe that happens, or maybe the happy 10th birthday remark will be accompanying whatever Vegapunk wants to give Bonnie. Also, now that we know how much Kuma cared for Bonnie, I really wonder how S-Bear and Bonnie would interact. If S-Bear senses that Bonnie is in danger, will S-Bear throw himself in the line of fire to save Bonnie? Because we do know that the Boa Hancock Seraphim was head over heels for Luffy, right? It was in her DNA. So if that emotion made it into the Hancock Seraphim, I wouldn't be surprised if S-Bear goes out of his way to save Bonnie from any and all threats. And hey, even if S-Bear doesn't go out of his way for Bonnie, I think the real Kuma is. So going back to how Vegapunk programmed Kuma to protect the Thousand Sunny, I wouldn't be super shocked if Vegapunk also added in an extra line and said, hey, if Bonnie's ever in danger, we need to protect her as well. Because if that's the case, if the original Kuma has that programming within him, that would perfectly line up and it would explain why Kuma hit the red line, climbed the red line, and then teleported away and may arrive here on Egghead Island. I think that makes a lot of sense. And of course, Come on, Kuma protecting his daughter as a pacifista, it, it, it's, it's A1, it's A1. But yeah, that's it for today's video, guys. Thank you so much for joining me on this little adventure. Sorry if this video is shorter than the previous reviews. I just feel like it's pretty straightforward, you know? There's not exactly too much to talk about, minus getting really mushy about the flashback. But nonetheless, I'm glad you guys were here on this little adventure.
If you guys are wondering what happened to the spoilers and you didn't see the previous videos or the community post, please go check the communities tab. I kind of explained it really in depth and well there. But TLDR, my account is being flagged and after 12 hours of the video being public, it then goes private. And that is not something that's going to be forever. I'm only expecting that to last for the next month or so and then we'll move back to it being up forever. It was between privatizing the videos after 12 hours or just straight up deleting them, and I've actually deleted all the past videos, and I just recently started privatizing them. So yeah, you know, pick your poison at this point, right? We got to cook with the ingredients we have, and unfortunately, this is all we have for the next month or so. But yeah, thank you guys so much for being here again, and if you made it to this point, please consider liking, commenting, and subbing down below. It would really mean a lot. And thank you to the channel members and patron members here on this side. You guys have been phenomenal, and I really appreciate your support. And I'll catch you guys on next week's chapter, because there is a chapter coming out next week, chapter 1103. We are not getting the break that is scheduled, and instead we'll be getting two weeks of break after the next chapter. Which is kind of crazy, but that's one piece, and it's like this every year. And yeah, I'll catch you guys later. Sai, signing out.